CD going? Hallelujah. Tom is doing everything upstairs. Bless his holy name. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. I'm just waiting for that CD to hit record. Are you all happy today? Are you all happy today? Amen. Turn to your neighbor, smile. Smile back. <laughs> Bless his holy name. I have a lot I want to share today, this morning. We good, Tom? Okay, let's just wait a few seconds. This is important, so I don't want any word missed or lost. We cool? We good? Oh, I got to stall. Let me tell a story. Once upon a time. We good? Hallelujah. Good morning, church. Can we give the Lord a shout this morning? Bless his holy name. The Lord is good. He's worthy to be praised. Thank you, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We thank you, Lord, in the midst of our life, in the midst of our situation, in the midst of our needs, in the midst of our wants, in the midst of our brokenness, you still saw value in us, and you called us to be royalty. I thank you, Lord, that you said in your word that the greatest in the kingdom is the servant. Lord, that you give us this morning the hearts of servants, that we would serve you with the right attitude, O oh Lord. Father, I thank you for the things that are shared today, that they would penetrate deep into the spirit of your people today. Holy Spirit, just begin working on them even now, even as you've begun to prepare them for this word this day. Lord, I thank you for fruit that comes from today. In Jesus' name, amen. How many of you love the anointing? Amen. The anointing goes side by side with God's grace. Right? God's grace is the, the, the availability of doing the impossible things. But the anointing of God is what really carries you through it. And we've all been gifted and we've all been anointed for different aspects of what God has called us for. Turn to your neighbor and say, you've been called. You've been called. Right? Scripture says, many are called, few are chosen. So how many want to be chosen? Amen. Amen. So the first thing I want to do, we're, we're talking this morning, in case you don't know what this was all about, we're going to be sharing about the ministry. We are going to be talking about this house, Pillars of Faith Tabernacle. Turn to your neighbor and say, Pillars of Faith. Not Pillars of Doubt. Not Pillars of Fear. Not Pillars of Unbelief, but Pillars of Faith. Are you a pillar of faith at Pillars of Faith? Amen. So first thing I need to share and I need to express is my gratitude for each and every one of you. Every single one of you that call this your house are very important. You have been called in this time and in this season to this house, and we value you. Amen. If you are visiting here this morning, if this is your first time or maybe you're a frequent visitor, I want to let you know that you're important too. I'm going to be sharing things about this house, and if Pillars isn't your house, that's okay. You're still going to learn some stuff. But be prepared. I'm going to speak for more than an hour. Okay? So how many of you have patience? Good. We'll find out. Amen. Second thing I want to do is I want to acknowledge everybody that has served or is serving in any capacity of ministry in this house. Can you just stand? I'm already standing. Not too bad. There's a few that didn't make it today. You know, some people weren't feeling well, but thank you. Why don't I want to bless the Lord for you guys. Why don't we bless the Lord for everyone that is standing. Thank you so much for your service. Amen. Hallelujah. Right off the bat, I want to do something here a little different. But in our efforts of perfecting, it's a small offering box. No, I'm kidding. 
Uh, in the efforts of perfecting the ministry, I want to reestablish our follow-up process. Amen? So can I have a host, please? Can you please hand one of these to everyone? That's a big stack. I know there's not that many people here. This is an information card. This is basically your name, phone number, email, birthday. Uh, which method do you desire to be contacted? If you don't mark any method, we're not going to contact you. How's that? Fair enough? So email, text, phone, carrier pigeon, smoke signals, <laughs> gossip line, however you want to be contacted, all right? Just please fill it out. And in about five or ten minutes, host, please collect them. We are talking this morning about the post-pandemic pillars. Can you say post-pandemic? Post-pandemic pillars. Throughout the scriptures, especially in the Old Testament, we see complete books of the Bible that are dedicated to the temple and the rebuilding of the temple. Correct? Correct. We have Nehemiah rebuilding the walls. We have Ezra rebuilding the temple. We have Haggai talking about rebuilding the temple. And it's a great scripture. I love Haggai. It talks about the temple is in ruins, but you're sitting at home fixing up your beautiful, luxurious homes. And you wonder why you can't keep money in your pocket, right? As if you have holes in your pockets. And it was a call. It was a wake-up call that Haggai said, come out and rebuild the house of God. So in a sense this morning, I'm talking about a rebuilding of the house of God. You hear me? You know where I'm talking about? Now we know in the New Testament, we are the temple of God, but we are talking about the physical building. How many of you know that this is not church? This is a building that each individual is the church. Turn to your neighbor and say, what a cute church you are. Amen. We are the church. We are the church. We are the church. Amen? So we have been called to be the bride. We have been called to be the church. And if God calls us, he calls us to the level of excellence. He calls us to the level of integrity. He calls us to do things as we would do them. My son started school this week. And in his schooling, the very first things they teach every morning is the Bible lesson. And one of the things that he learned this week in the teaching, that if you're going to do anything, you do it for God. And if you're going to do it for God, you do it the best. Amen? How many agree? Now, if a four-year-old can learn that, I guess we could learn that too. Amen? It says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, no matter what you do, what you eat, what you talk about, do it all for the glory of God. Amen? So I want to share with you this morning ministry, and then I'm going to go through every ministry that we have and have had that is inactive that we need to reestablish in the church and what role you're going to play in it. There should have been a round of applause there. Amen. Sharing from a teaching that I did many years ago, called Developing Christian Character, I went back and I pulled some notes. What is ministry? Many who have been trained for the work of God haven't advanced in their walk with God, not because they lack training, but because they lack the development of true Christian character. In the teaching, I present to the people the best description of true Christian character is the Christ-likeness in you. When people look at you, do they see Jesus? Do they see Jesus the way he acts, Jesus the way he behaved? Every ministry that we do is done unto God. So the way God takes honor in it is if we do it with the same character and the same integrity as if you were Jesus actually doing the work. Right? You understand? Because we are all doing this for the kingdom of God. I'm not doing this for fame. I don't want to be famous. Jesus didn't want to be famous either. Look how that turned out. All right? 
In other words, my heart is not to be noticed. Jesus made no reputation of himself, yet he's the most famous, the biggest reputation that has ever lived. So in other words, my goal as a pastor of this church is not so everyone can see me. My goal is that everyone would see Jesus. Amen? amen. Big fat amen. 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 There you go. Say amen like you mean it. Amen. 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 So this is what ministry is. Number one, it's servanthood. The greatest in the kingdom is a servant. So you could say it this one, the greatest in the kingdom are those that do ministry. Amen? The second thing that ministry is, it's not power, it's not position, and it's not your own authority. The third thing that ministry is, ministry is people. Right, that remind that kind of, just every time I read that phrase, it always brings me back to soil and green, you know? Silent green is people, you know. It's people. It's people. Whether you're the pastor, you're the apostle, you're the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher, whether you scrub the toilet, it's for people. Amen? Oh, I said scrub the toilet. It's already turned half of you off. <laughs> Ministry is not for personal advantage, but so that you can help others. And also, lastly, ministry is not what you can get out of it. You know, sometimes people have ulterior motives. Sometimes people go into ministry because they want to be able to gain recognition or they want to be able to uh, consume all of the pastor's time with 400 hours of personal counseling. You have to be selfless. Turn to your neighbor and say, what did you do with self? You killed them? Good. Right? It's not what you can get out of it. It's what you put into it. Can I get an amen? amen. <clears throat> Within our godly character must be the quality of faithfulness. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you faithful? It requires faithfulness to take us forward to fruitfulness. It takes faithfulness to make us fruitful. Now, God has spoken over this house quite a few times personal words of prophecy. I'll remind you about Chuck Pierce when he was just here a couple of months ago, that this would be a place where healing would flow from. Nothing new. We've heard this prophecy many times. We've heard the prophecies many times of people lining up to get into these doors to get healed. God has promised that the latter house would be greater than the former house. God has promised us and spoke that we would have other properties, our kidney academy next door, across the street, whatever it might be, whatever the things that God has promised, God has promised. But in order for fruitfulness to take place, faithfulness must come first, which means each and every one of us that call this our home need to be true, faithful ministers, very much along the lines like Akil was sharing about having a, a love that extends further than our limits of just self, my four, and no more. You've been called as a Christian to serve. You have been called as a Christian to walk in love. You've been called, listen, walking in love means you're not in the equation. It means everyone else around you is more important than you. The kind of love, the agape kind of love that God had and the kind of agape love that Jesus demonstrated was he died for you when you were still a sinner. <clears throat> so in these end days, we got to be willing to minister to people the love of God, whether it's in this house or in the streets prayer walking or when it's opening up a prayer station or whatever it might be, just being the light of the world. Whatever it is, you need to be faithful and you need to get out of the way. Amen? Because if you want fruit, you need to be faithful. Jesus says when we all stand before him, well done, Good, faithful, servant. Doesn't say well done, beautiful, handsome, not so well done, fool yourself. Amen. So you still love me? Oh, I'm not done. No. It requires faithfulness to take us forward to fruitfulness, 
and increase in the work of God. 1 Corinthians 1.9 says this, God is faithful. Who's faithful? God is faithful. Through whom you are called into fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3 says, But the Lord is faithful, who will establish you. Say establish. Establish means you've been rooted and you're set apart for his service. You've been consecrated. You've been called. You don't just show up. Right? Am I reading into this wrong? He will establish you and guard you from the evil one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and 24. But may the God of peace make you holy in every way, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless until that day when our Lord Jesus comes again. That's without spot, that's without wrinkle. Verse 34, God who calls you is faithful and he will do this. Again, our Christ-like character is faithfulness. It's love. It's sacrifice. It's obedience. You glad you showed up? I'm glad you showed up. <clears throat> I feel sad for the people that did not show up that have to listen to this on the CD because I pray that the anointing of God that is on my words today gets transferred to the CD. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23 in the Amplified. Ampl Amplified classic. So let us seize and hold fast and retain without wavering the hope we cherish and confess and our acknowledgement of it. For he who promised is reliable, he's sure, and he's faithful to his word. Turn to your neighbor, say reliable. reliable. Say sure. sure. Say faithful, faithful. To, your word. to your word. Amen. Does it sound like you? Does that sound like you? If you're not sure, you're not faithful, and you're not true to your word, it's time to go to the spiritual chiropractor and get some bones cracked. It's time to get in shape. Amen? This is not, by the way, this is not a beat-up session. This is a love session. I've never been to a chiropractor. Has anyone ever been to a chiropractor? Yeah. Amen. Getting your back adjusted, the moment he cracks those bones, does it hurt? I, I've never been there. I don't know. She's shaking her head yes, and you're saying no. Maybe he said no. I don't know. Maybe you got the wrong chiropractor, Mary. I don't know. Does he use a bat? Right? I don't know. But I do know if you have plastic surgery, that's painful. Right? If you want to look beautiful and you got to get rid of some imperfections, you got to go through some pain first. You know, the world says before you get to heaven, you got to go through a little hell. Yeah, not biblical, but you, know, you understand, right? 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. We have all been born in his image. If we're born in his image, that makes us imitators of him, right? It says this, For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them, the word of God, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by greed or lust. In Genesis first chapter, verse 26, we see we were created in the image of God, but through Adam's fall, we lost the ability to live consistently in the spirit. Right? How many of you ever find you need to work yourself into the spirit? Right? It's usually every morning. <laughs> Amen? Because we usually, you know, during something happens when we sleep. It's like it all wears off. You know, but his mercies are new every morning. Right? So we got to get into the spirit every morning and get ourselves in the place where we could be prepared for our day. And if you don't do that, start tomorrow. Amen? Adam's fall caused death and destruction to enter the human race, causing the pollution of man's character. When we were born of God, the salvation we received includes the process 
of being conformed to the very image of Jesus. Right? Your spirit got saved, right? You were justified by his blood. Your dead spirit came back to life. You received the Zoe of God, immortality. Your eternal life began, but you still think like a filthy, rotten sinner. Right? The first day you got saved. So the process of sanctification, taking the word of God and making this thing holy, is process. It's process. How many of you are holy? Every one of your hands should go up. How many of you think holy? Every one of your hands should have stayed down. Because it's in process. How many of you think better today than you did a year ago? It's a process, right? So as the process of the renewing of the mind is taking place, what is also happening is the perfection of of God's holiness being formed and you conforming to his image here. This is already conformed to his image. Okay, Pastor? Right? Am I in the right church? Okay, you still love me? Thank you, I love you too. So we're in process. Turn to your neighbor and say, we are in process. Scripture says, God is working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure, right? So, you know, I said many years ago, we all are construction zones. We are all in construction. We should have red and orange cones around us at all times, <laughs> right? Because we are in process. There is tearing down going on and there is building up going on in each one of us that is progressively moving forward in God. If you tore down the old structures of what you used to be and you just put up a little pup tent and you're satisfied with your pup tent, any wind will blow your pup tent away. Amen? Build yourself a freedom tower. Be the biggest, the brightest, the tallest so your light can shine over the entire city. Oh, they like that part, I think. I'm not too sure because the reaction was like, huh? Thank you, Rosie. I'm going to buy Rosie pom-poms. <laughs> Amen? Romans 8.29 says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined them to be conformed to the image of his Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Amen? We are joint heirs with Jesus. We should be just like Jesus. The Father sees us already just like Jesus, but in our own estimation, and maybe even in the estimation of other people around us who love us, or maybe don't love us so much, reveal to us where we really are. And if we're not conforming to the image of Jesus, if people don't turn around and go, oh, it's Jesus, oh, it's just you. You know, something wrong. You're multiplying the fish on your job? Are you doing the things, the greater works that Jesus said you should do? The things that the reputation that Jesus had was the great love that he had, the compassion he had on sinners, and the miracle working dunamis power that he carried. That's the things that people need to see. Amen? Not every believer, unfortunately, is faithful. Now, if you just came to Jesus, you're a baby Christian. You're newly born again. You've only got born again, you know, 34 years ago. And you're still wearing your, your, your spiritual diapers. And you're still stumbling. And you're still making mistakes. And you haven't really been freed from your strongholds. And you're still curse a little bit. And you still do things that you're not. Listen. You determine your growth. You determine your maturity. To the desire you want to be holy and Christ-like, will determine your drive to be like him. Some people are satisfied with their sin. Some of them have pet sins. Oh, come here, my little adultery. <laughs> You're so cute. <laughs> uh, let me tell you something. Adultery doesn't just have to be sexual. Any idolatry that you make more important than God is adultery. Unfaithfulness is evident in such things as this. Poor church attendance, often because of adverse weather. Too hot, too cold, too humid, too windy, right? We call these the Goldilocks Christians. They will only show up when conditions are just right.
What they don't tell you about the true story of Goldilocks was the bear ate her. <laughs> By the way, this is not things I made up. This is a consensus of pastors that have been questioned about unfaithfulness. Okay? Number one, poor church attendance. They only show up when it's convenient. You know why they do that? Well, some have legitimate reasons. Some do work jobs. Right? That, that, I would think that would be a legitimate reason, yet we're supposed to honor God with a day of rest and not work. Right? So the divine favor of God is upon your life to get your schedule changed. And if your boss will not let you off, let me tell you something. If a boss asks an Orthodox Jew to work on Saturday, not only will they not work on Saturday, the first thing they do is they pick up their phone and call their lawyer. Can we please sue him? He's violating my religious rights. He's violating my First Amendment rights to serve God the way I see fit. Christians, on the other hand, I can't do that. I'm too spineless. I need my money. Don't you know my boss shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory? Houston, we have a problem. Matter of fact, four years ago, there was a little old black lady that her boss wanted her to work on Sunday. And she did exactly that. She called the lawyer and sued her boss and got $6 million. No more work needed. <laughs> now, I'm not saying show up on your job on Sunday so you can sue them. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying this is a windfall lotto situation. I'm saying that you need to stand up for who you are in Christ. Even if you think you might sacrifice a job or a day's pay, they are not your provider. God is. If you're faithful. If you're faithful. If you're faithful, if you're serving him wholeheartedly, if you're not leaving doors open for the enemy to steal, kill, and destroy from you. See, the, the joy just fell. <laughs> yeah! Oh, God. Listen, we're in the house to, perfect, to be perfected, right? So number one is poor church attendance. Number two, unfaithfulness, tithes, and offerings. Now, this was done... Let me just say, I did this teaching, it's got to be seven, eight, nine years ago. I don't know if this number's changed. Research shows that less than 20% of all Christians faithfully tithe. How does, a, how does a ministry or church ministry survive like that? Well, I guess when they have churches of 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, 12,000 people, they survive. How do churches of 10 and 15 and 20 survive like that. They don't. They close shop. That's why so many pastors quit every month, because they can't handle the pressure. So if only 20% faithfully tithe, we could say that 80% of Christians are unfaithful in their giving to the Lord. But I don't believe in tithing. Well, God does. And in this house, we do too. We don't believe the, list, the legalistic Levitical law of tithing. We believe that God instituted the principle of tithing way before law ever existed. So it's not something we do legalistically. It's something we do that if we give God the best portion, the most holy portion to our high priest, that he is truly honored in our giving. Amen? And he will bless us back. The third thing, unfaithfulness, not being consistent in areas of delegated responsibility, right? So you ask somebody, I, I'm just going to make up something. Uh, housekeeping, I'm going to pick on you, but I don't mean it, okay? Uh, ask the housekeeper, uh, here's an example. There was gum on the rug. Uh, somehow gum got on the rug this week. I don't know how, who brought the gum in, but it was on somebody's shoe, I guess, and it got on the rug. So housekeeping, please clean the gum off the rug because we don't want to spread it and have 42 spots of gum. Oh, I never got to it. It was too busy. You know, there was a chirping bird and it distracted me and all these different things happened and I never got the gum up. Being inconsistent in areas of delegated responsibility. 
All the preaching in the world will not produce faithfulness, commitment, zeal, a giving of oneself in service, etc. I can preach about it, but it will never produce any of that. These things become evident when the person is yielded to the Holy Spirit and he is walking in love and he has a renewed mind. Walk in the Spirit, yielding to the Spirit, walking in love and has a renewed mind. And the last thing I have for unfaithfulness is being religious, lukewarm, having a worldly lifestyle without any conviction of the Holy Spirit of love whatsoever. What does that mean? That means the things that God finds, you know, offensive, you find delight in. Okay? You understand? We need to be able to be. Now, of course, I'm not speaking to anybody here, right? Now, I'm not saying we have to live under a rock, and I'm not talking about being legalistic. If anything, Pillars is far from a legalistic church. We believe in the freedom. We allow people to kind of do almost what they want to do here. Right? We are about seeing captives set free. We're here about seeing people being freed from bondage and sicknesses and disease, being freed from fear. We're about freedom and where the spirit of the Lord is. There is no legalism unless you choose to make it legal. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. This house isn't about legalism. The house is about order. Order is not legalism. God instituted order. Yeah. Amen? So religious lukewarm, worldly lifestyle without the conviction of the Holy Spirit of love. In other words, they are unfaithful in their marriage covenant with Jesus. They are unfaithful in their marriage covenant with Jesus. Don't be that person. Amen? Fruit should be evidence as we mature and develop our character. It's not just the fruit of the Spirit. It's also the begetting of spiritual fruit. Sheep beget sheep. Right? It's about bringing people in and having their fruit remain. Amen? A, a life yielded to the Spirit of God will have these qualities. And, of course, you know the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Out of that love comes joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there's no law. Amen? Are you glad you came this morning? Let's explore how the character qualifications of elders is important to us. You know, the Bible talks about the importance of the character of elders. Right? Turn to your neighbor and say, but I'm not an elder. After it talks about elders, it all goes on and it actually talks about the same quality characteristics of deacons. Turn to him and say, but I'm not a deacon. Well, guess what? The simplified definition of the word deacon is servant or a server. Okay? It's not necessarily a title. It's an attitude. An elder, on the other hand, is a title. Right? But we're going to look at this for a second. Because the callings and the qualifications of elders are actually God's calling upon all Christians. While elders are meant to exemplify these traits, all Christians must display them. I want us to consider whether we actually display these traits and to learn together how we can pray and have a greater measure. So let's talk about the qualifications all right, the first qualification we're going to talk about is being above reproach. Have you ever heard that term before? Above reproach. 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 2 says, Therefore an overseer must be above reproach. It's also repeated twice in the book of Titus chapter 1. If anyone is above reproach, for an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. Verses 6 and 7 of Titus 1. Whatever it means to be above reproach, it is not only for elders or church leaders. Colossians 3 teaches that the great hope and the comfort of every Christian is that God himself will one day say, one day, will one day, that Christ himself one day will present you holy 
and blameless and above reproach before him. That's Colossians 1.22. Every Christian is to be and to live above reproach. How many know John MacArthur? Now, John MacArthur, you know, he's a little comforted. A little, you know, he doesn't like the, the manifestations. He calls them unholy fire and all this stuff, you know. But he says this. This is a quote from John MacArthur. The reason this qualification is called for at the pastoral level is because we as pastors are examples by which you all are to follow. And it and if being above reproach is part of that example, then guess what? It's required of you the same trait. Crickets. I hear crickets. What does it mean to be above reproach? That would be a good place to go next, right? The English Standard Version translates as above reproach is first a legal word that indicates a kind of innocence in the eyes of the law. The Greek, above reproach, is one word. And that word is an ankletos. An ankletos. And it is, the, the root word means to be unaccused. Turn to the neighbor and say unaccused. That is, by implication, irreproachable. Blameless, not to be called to account, unreprovable. Now, unreprovable means uncorrectable. And that doesn't mean it's a person who refuses to be corrected. It means it's a person that cannot be found fault in. He's uncorrectable because there's nothing to correct. Above reproach. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm so glad you're above reproach. It means to be blameless. It means that no one can legitimately rebuke you or make any charges against you that will stick. Now, many people will make accusations. Many, many sinners will make accusation. Oh, you go to that church, oh, they want your money. They're all greedy. No. Unfortunately, many more Christians will make accusations against their own brothers. See it all the time. Just go on Facebook. Go on Spaced Out Book. My God, you would think Joel Osteen was the devil himself. Right? Right? Boy, they're above reproach? They have already proven that they are not above reproach by judging their brother. Oh, okay. Get on with it, Pastor Vin. Get on with it. So we have these bumper stickers downstairs, and we've had them for many years. You see what this says? Can you see it? I'll read it to you. If you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Above reproach. They may accuse, but your conduct will eventually acquit you by proving you blameless. Amen. Now, why am I getting into all this? Because there is a level of Christian maturity that must be involved in ministry. You know, I was talking to somebody not too long ago, and we hear, we've heard this over the years. All the big faith ministries, you know, Kenneth Copeland, Jerry Seville, uh, Joyce Meyer, you know, all these big, big ministries that hire, you know, hundreds of people. As soon as a person is in their flesh, they get fired. Because the whole ministry's integrity is on every single person's quality. Amen? That seems kind of heartless, doesn't it? No. Because a little, love, a little leaven spoils the whole lump, the Bible teaches us. And a little sin here and a little sin there will bring down a ministry. Don't think so? It's true. All right? So our life has to be so consistent that your reputation is credible. Credible Christianity. You are an example worth following, and you do not make the gospel look fake 
by talking one thing while doing another, right? If you're gonna talk the talk, walk the walk. Naturally, we wanna know the standard, the word, before which we must be found blameless. And the standard we must uphold. In his book, Biblical Eldership, Alexander Strach explains, what is meant by above reproach is defined by the character qualities that followed the term. Thus, being above reproach is expressed through those other qualities in 1 Timothy 3, 2, Titus 1, and by extension, 1 Peter 5. Being above reproach is your marriage. Being above reproach in your marriage means you are the husband of one wife, right? Being above reproach in your thought life means you're sober-minded. Being above reproach in your actions means you are self-controlled. Is that too much to ask? Let's go walking in the spirit, church. What we see is that this is a kind of summary attribute and that the blameless Christian is the one who upholds all of God's revealed will. I'm going to say that line again. What we see is that this is the kind of summary attribute and that the blameless Christian is the one who upholds all of God's revealed will. Now listen carefully. Of course, being above reproach does not mean being perfect. Turn to your neighbor and say, are you perfect? Not talking about walking in perfection. Because we know that there was only one perfect man. We are, to, we are to drive to be that. We are to do that. And when we fall short, when we sin, we confess it and turn from it because our standard is perfection. That's the standard. That's what we aim for. When we fall short, thank God we can go and get it right. Now, if you seem to be asking God to forgive you for the same sin every single day for 36 years, maybe it's time to change. Maybe you haven't truly got an understanding of the repentance part of it. Repentance is not when you feel bad from your sin. The Greek word repentance is a compound of two words, after knowledge. Once the Holy Spirit reveals to you why he's grieved, He's given you the information. He, he has shown you why his heart is broken. Now his grace steps in and helps you to turn away from it to never do it again. Amen? That's, by the way, in the program. When are you going to get to the ministry part? Gee, I told you this is going to be long, right? I have nine more pages. Good Lord. I don't. The primary means through which you gain this characteristic is taking advantage of God's means of grace. The word, applying the word, praying with your family, faithfully attending your church's worship services, participating in the other services, Bible studies, prayer meetings, youth groups, etc. These are the very means through which God extends his sanctifying grace, and you cannot expect to be or remain above reproach if you neglect them. Was that a mouthful? You're going to have to get the CD. Last week I talked about unity, remember? I started to lay the groundwork for today, last week. By the way, how many had a blessed time at the barbecue? Oh, I, awesome reports, okay? Everyone had a great time. And I kind of touched on a couple things in the unity. One of the things I talked about was clicks. Does anyone not know what the term click means? It's not, I'm not talking about that kind of click. It's not C L I C K. C I U Q U E, whatever. I got it spelled out right there, right? So a click is when groups of people separate themselves and leave other people out of the group. Okay? So let me just touch on this for two seconds. Click is division. Clicks are division. Say division. I want to tell you a story. One of the things we do at Victorious Overcomers Support Group is we present this program to other churches to become affiliated with us. We had an affiliate in Staten Island. It was part of Jason Alvarez's church network. How many know Jason Alvarez? 
Love of Jesus Family Church, right? So he was a pastor. His name was Pastor Rudy Romiggio. And he took the program. He was very excited about it. And he raised up his, his director. The guy's name was Tom. And he started running it in the West Brighton area of Staten Island. Projects, gang activity, high drug use. But the director of the program started to create within the church another church. Within the church. And when the pastor realized what was going on, he shut the whole thing down. But you know what happened? That church does not exist anymore. Because it created a division. Because one person thought they had a better way of doing it without being in submission to the lead pastor who is the head of the program at the church. According to the training manual, the director needs to be in direct submission to the pastor or church leader and must meet with him on a weekly basis because ultimately the pastor is the one responsible before God for what takes place to the people in their victorious overcomer support group. It's in the leader's training manual. It couldn't be expressed more clearly, but he decided now we're going to do our own services, and we're going to do our own teachings. And the people weren't going to the Sunday church anymore. They were going to the Victorious Overcomers Church. So now, because division entered in, that church doesn't exist in Staten Island. Isn't that terrible? The devil uses division. And you know what division is? When there becomes two visions in a church. When the pastor says this, and you say, no, we're going to do different. Pastor says, this is the direction we're going. No, I think we should go this way. You know, and just little seeds. I, want, I don't want to use a political term here, but little seeds of insurrection are planted in hearts of people. That's a dangerous thing. So let's talk about this. It's not a big problem. I just want to touch on it. Does anyone know who C.S. Lewis is? Sure. Christian author, right? He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia and some other things. He once said this about cliques, which he calls the inner ring. Exclusion is no accident. It is the essence. What does that mean? Reworded more simply, some people being left out of cliques is not an accident. It is done totally on purpose. It's whole reason that a clique exists. So we will not have any cliques in the church. Okay? We are a multicultural church. We've always been a multicultural church, and we will all blend together as one, being in one place, in one spirit, one mind, one heart, one purpose, one vision, one goal. Amen. And that's how it has to be. That's how it is in heaven. Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians 1.10, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all agree with one another in what you say, and that there would be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. Turn to your neighbor and say, sounds like us. Sounds like us. Hallelujah. Are you glad you came this morning? Yes. I'm so happy you all came this morning. When Paul says he wants the church to agree with one another and have no division among them and to be perfectly united, what is he talking about? I'll tell you. He wants the church members to be loving and friends with one another and stick together through thick and thin. If there are cliques or divisions in a church, how is that making outsiders feel? If everyone getting along like God wants them to, isn't that more of an attraction? You know, we have a divisive world out there. It's very divisive out there. By design, it's very divisive out there. And they come into a house where they sense the love of God and they feel important and they feel loved. And wow, all these people are getting together and we don't have this section and that section like I joked about last week, right? But they see, wow, this must be what heaven's like. Yeah, heaven on earth, welcome to it. Amen? Divisions in the Greek is the word schisma. And that's where we get schisms from. And what is a schisma? It's a split or a gap, literally or figuratively. It means division, rent, and schism. The Passion Translation of this last verse says, I urge you, my brothers and sisters, 
for the sake of the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, to agree to live in unity with one another. Footnote, or that you will all speak the same thing. That is to have a united testimony. The Aramaic can be translated that you may all be of one word and put to rest any divisions that attempt to tear you apart. Footnote, the congregation of believers in Corinth was sorely divided. We see it throughout the whole book. Paul has to address it throughout the whole book of 1 Corinthians. Right? They had divided over which leader or what apostle they would follow, over the limits of their freedom, over their socioeconomic status, and over their spiritual giftings. Divisions among believers grossly hinders our message and ministry to the world of unbelievers. Paul is pleading with them to unite around the love of God for one another. So put to rest any divisions that attempts to tear you apart and be restored or be fully equipped. As one united body living in perfect harmony, form a consistent choreography among yourselves, having a common perspective with shared values. Yeah. Amen? Sounds like pillars. Now, we're coming to a close here before I start addressing ministries. 1 Corinthians 3, chapters 1 to 4. Passion. Brothers and sisters, when I was with you, I found it impossible to speak to you as those who are spiritually mature people. For you are all still dominated by the mindset of flesh. And because you are immature infants in Christ, I had to nurse you and feed you with milk not with the solid food of more advanced teaching because you weren't ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready to be fed solid food for you are living your lives dominated by the mindset of flesh. Ask yourself, is there any jealousy among you? Do you compare yourselves with others? Do you quarrel like children and end up taking sides? If so, this proves you are living your life centered on yourselves, dominated by the mindset of flesh, and behaving like unbelievers. Verse 4. For when you divide yourselves up into groups, a Paul group and a Paulus group, footnote, Apollos was a brilliant, educated Alexandrian Jew, and his follow he was a follower of John the Baptizer. While in Ephesus, Apollos meant Priscilla and Aquila, who directed him into deeper teachings of Christ. That's Acts 18. Apparently, the church of Corinth was deeply divided and in need of wisdom and unity. You're acting like people without the Spirit's influence. Okay? So if Paul had to address this over and over again, we need to constantly remind ourselves that we need to be a church of love, like-minded, one accord, where the Spirit of God can have his way. There's a word that is used in the Word of God, and it's called submission. We have to lay down how we see things and submit to authority and mostly submit to God. Okay? Now we're going to talk about ministries now. You ready? You sure? Pause. Could take a water break. 